So hi everyone, um, very excited today just to give you an update on the NEAR ecosystem um, and everything that we're focusing on and in particular to make the case for um, self-sovereignty and user-owned AI and it was great, you know, that earlier panel um, definitely touched on a lot of themes that are very close to our heart and I'm here with my colleague and we were both nodding away throughout that entire panel which is, which is always you know, great, great to see. But for those of you who don't know me, my name is Chris Donovan. I'm the COO at the Near Foundation. Um, I was previously the general counsel, um, so I describe myself as a corporate lawyer in, in recovery. Um, and I, I valued Robbie's uh, <laughs> comment earlier about lawyers being saviors. I don't think I've ever heard anyone describe lawyers like that before, so thanks. Thanks, Robbie, that was a nice, nice pick-me-up this morning. Um, and for those of you who don't know the Near Foundation, we are a regulated um, Swiss nonprofit, and our mandate is to look after the, um, the ongoing growth and development of the Near Protocol, which is a sharded layer one blockchain, and the ecosystem, the, the large vibrant ecosystem um, that, is, that is built around it. So to start with, what I usually do is, is just give a little bit of context to the, to the Near project in general, um, because I think it's, it's helpful particularly to to, to kind of rationalize what we're working on right now. And so actually NIR started out its life not as a blockchain project, but actually as an AI project, right? And it was, it was co-founded by Ilya Polosukin and Alex Skidanov. And Ilya in particular is hugely influential in the world of AI, right? He is one of the co-authors of the paper, Attention is All You Need. And that paper pioneered Transformers, which is the technology that powers all of these amazing large language models at the moment. And while Ilya and Alex were working on this AI startup near AI, they were working with um, researchers and contributors all over the world, and they were trying to get large amounts of data labeled and categorized to feed into these models. And they ran into a problem, which was how do we reimburse and pay these people for their work at scale, right? Because these people are distributed all over the world, um, lots of different countries, lots of different payment rails. And they thought to themselves, well, that seems like a use case that blockchain could solve for, right? It's, it's a globally distributed payment network, at least in, in some of its iterations, right? But at that time, this is back in 2018, um, they surveyed the market and they couldn't actually find a piece of blockchain infrastructure that served their needs, that was truly scalable and actually cheap to use at scale. And so being the, the kind of superstar engineers that they are, they thought to themselves, well, we'll just build our own blockchain. Um, and that's how NIA came about. So the, the unifying vision for, for NIA has always been um, what we call the open web, right? And that is a, an, an internet, an online environment where all users control their data, they control their assets, and they control power of governance over the platforms and the services that they use. And really, when we think about the open web, we're thinking about and we're talking about self-sovereignty, and we've heard that word used a lot, but really it's about fundamentally shifting the power dynamic. Right now, power is very much embedded with, and in some cases, or some people might say irrevocably captured by these very large closed corporations, right? And these corporations have gotten very good at their business models, and their business models are all about optimizing for profit, and their closest analog that they've discovered for maximizing that, that profit output is attention, right? And they don't care about anything else. That is just the nature of the incentive model. And that isn't necessarily uh, meant to be a kind of disparaging or derogatory comment. There's not necessarily malintent behind it. It's just the nature of that incentive structure it means that inevitably they try and capture more attention to generate more profit. They get even better at capturing our attention until actually now these systems, they touch every aspect of our lives, everything that we do is touched by these closed systems. And at the moment, that distribution of power and the distribution of value and that incentive loop leads to a whole bunch of very negative consequences, right? It leads to things like wealth inequality. It leads to things like, um, you know, the prevalence of misinformation and disinformation because these things, they capture attention and generate profit, but they're not necessarily good for the world. They're not necessarily good for the users to be, to be digesting, right? And there was a comment on the panel earlier about thinking through the intent for what these systems are actually designed to be doing. And at the moment, they're designed to capture attention. 
And that attention capture erodes our self-sovereignty, right? We start, you know, we, we start getting these hunches to buy new products we haven't thought about before because we've subconsciously been, you know, getting these adverts. We, you know, we, we have those spooky moments where we're talking about something with our, with our partners at home and all of a sudden an ad pops up on Instagram or Facebook and people are like, wow, that's, that's spooky, right? And they're very good at it now. They're, they're amazing good. They have teams of, you know, neuroscientists and psychologists programming to make these things as, as powerful and as addictive as possible. And, and we think that, you know, that, that paradigm is flawed. And if you introduce AI into that paradigm, all you're going to do is amplify enormously all of these issues, all of these problems. And because AI, as we've just been hearing about, is such a transformative, enormously impactful technology, our belief is that it is fundamentally important to ensure that that technology is put into the hands of users, right? It's controlled and owned and operated in a self-sovereign way. And we actually think that this moment is enormously important. We're at, a, at an inflection point. And I don't want to be a, a kind of doomsayer here, right? And we have heard about some of the potential dangers of AI. But I actually think the biggest danger is irrevocably entrenching this closed paradigm, right? Where we end up having a few mega corporations that control everything that we do. And right now, I don't know about you guys, but you know, I don't want Sam to be telling me how to think about the world, what things I like to do, who I want to meet and fall in love with. That's too much power for one person. It's too much power for even a small group of individuals. But more importantly, individuals should have that self-sovereign ability to decide the, the types of information that they want to consume, for example, the types of models they want to use. They should also have an ability to interrogate those models. They should understand, well, if my information is in one of these data sets that is generating billions of dollars of revenue for OpenAI, where's my share of that? My data is valuable. I've given it to you. I should get something in return. And right now, the system is just not at all set up for that. And it leads to some very negative outcomes. And our view is the solution to that very substantial problem is all about the effective unication of blockchain technology and AI. And I think you know, the key features of blockchain technology, more than anything else, are first of all that they can, it can actually guarantee self-sovereignty. Right? It, it's not, people often describe it as trust minimized, and that's actually not what it is. It's trust guaranteed. You do not need to trust anybody else in the network to be able to transact with them. It's enormously powerful. And a consequence of that self-sovereignty and the fact that these networks are permissionless and autonomous, and so anyone anywhere can use them, right? And also, they always operate in the same way for everyone. There's no one kind of changing the rules. There's no ins and outs, first-class citizens versus second-class citizens. Everyone is treated in the same way by this technology. So it then creates you know, these um, enormous potential for supporting open economies. And most importantly, a solution, an economic solution for supporting open systems. Because right now, in a way, a lot of these AI you know, projects, again, they're not, they're not sitting there trying to you know, evilly take over the entire world, but they don't have an, alter an effective alternative to raising all of the capital and funding the enormous expenditure that is needed to develop these AI models, right? It's, in, it's billions and billions of dollars worth of cost. Like the, the GPUs, the compute, everything is so expensive. And right now, and OpenAI even itself tried this. They, they started out being open, open source everything. We're a public good. And you know, a few years into that journey, they realized if they want to raise enough money to be able to, to compete and do this effectively, they needed to resort to the closed model. They got a bunch of stakeholders, and they are now primarily motivated by profit. And we think that's an enormous problem. So thinking about the solution then, right, and this unification of blockchain and web, uh, blockchain and, and AI, pardon me, you know, we think that creates the possibility for an online environment, an internet, and, and broadly a world where users' well-being and also their economic success can be optimized for instead of attention, right? And if we think about, first of all, from our perspective in the near ecosystem, right, we have both of those components, which we're very proud of. Right? We have the near protocol, right, which is a layer one blockchain ecosystem. It's very scalable, um, it's very cheap to use, and we're very proud of the fact that we are home to some of the largest consumer-based Web3 applications in the world. Right? We, we have about two million daily active users, which is more than any other blockchain ecosystem. But I think most excitingly of all, 
We've recently released some core contributors in the ecosystem, I should say, have recently released this technology called chain signatures. Right? And what that effectively enables is from your near account, so from one place, one user interface, you can facilitate and transact all of your digital asset interactions, regardless of which ecosystem, which canonical blockchain, doesn't matter. And if any of you are particularly familiar with, well, in fact, how many of you hold digital assets? How many of you have a you know, self-hosted method of holding those digital assets? So less, right? So you know, the old adage, not your keys, not your coins. But if any of you who have the, these self-hosted wallets, right, have experienced the, the absolute agony and pain of writing down seed phrases for 20 different wallet providers, 20 different um, canonical blockchain ecosystems, bridging, I mean, bridging, don't, you know, don't get me started, it's awful. And it's also an enormous security risk, right? So what Chain Signatures does is it solves for that. So actually, from your near account, you can transact on any blockchain you like. You can manage your Bitcoin, you can manage your Ethereum, your Polkadot, no bridging, no security risks, um, and most importantly of all, good user experience, right? A user experience that mimics the, the current Web2 user experience that's become so prevalent, right? And people, when you talk to them and you say, don't you think self-sovereignty is important? You know, don't you think that these values um, you know, as something that you should be fighting for, that, you, that should inform how you're making your choices about what technology you use. And they go, well, yeah, definitely. But like, I also want my Amazon to arrive tomorrow when I want my delivery to arrive in five minutes. So I don't care about it as, as much as that. And so we've realized that values aren't enough to bring people into this new paradigm. You have to meet some of these Web2 organizations and beat them at their own game. And the way that you do that is with user experience, equivalent user experience. You make it easy for them to take that step. So I think that's one piece of the puzzle. It's, it's making blockchain technology easily adoptable for, you know, for anyone, right? And then the second piece, as I mentioned, is this user-owned AI component. Now, we've recently, in the last sort of six to nine months or so, been focusing increasingly on AI. Right? And, and actually, Ilya and Alex have kind of now gone full circle. And we launched recently a new um, AI R&D lab called Near.ai. And they are focusing on generating some really amazing um, technology and functionality and products that, that runs on our permissionless autonomous ecosystem in an open way. Right? And one of these really cool um, products is what we call AI developer. And actually, this is, a, this is a model which is able, from natural language, to create end-to-end -end functioning Web3 applications, including user interfaces, from scratch. So that means that non-technical people can literally, in the space of a few minutes, they can create a, a fully functioning Web3 application, right? And at the moment, one of the biggest barriers to entry for Web3 is that the developer pool is very small, and it's, it's very technical to develop. So we think this is an enormous opportunity to try and unify these two worlds together. And the last thing that I'll say is, in addition to this near AI kind of R&D research lab, we're also building more broadly the fundamental components for a user-owned AI ecosystem, right? And when I say user-owned AI, I mean these are models which are run on user devices, right? They are fully segregated and private, so users can decide when and where and how they share their information. They're hyper-personalized as well to you specifically. The, your interests and your desires, you're not being aggregated and nudged and pushed from lots of different directions. You control your own digital fate and you control your own digital dignity, right? And for that to be the case, there needs to be open source, permissionless and autonomous resources for all of these types of applications to function. This is everything from you know, uh, databases and data sets to um, you know, compute and inference to um, experiences and, and, and agentic kind of um, front ends and, and all the rest of it, right? And so right now, and if anyone here is, is, is building something that kind of fits the bill, please come and, and see me afterwards. We're running um, an incubation cohort called Near Horizon, right? With, with a bunch of projects, um, you know, really incredible uh, Web3 AI projects building these different kind of pieces of infrastructure. And we're fitting them all together you know, in, a, in a kind of patchwork to create this fertile, almost primordial suit for, for this open, you know, uh, user-owned AI to emerge. And we think that if you believe that the values that I've been talking about, openness and self-sovereignty, are important, this is, the, you know, this is the way to try and guarantee that it happens. 
it's still going to be really hard, and we might not succeed. I, I vehemently hope that we do, but I think we have to try, and if we don't, then I think it's inevitable that this closed paradigm will be victorious, and I think the consequences, they might not feel material now, but they absolutely will be in the future. So I think we have to stay optimistic, we have to stay hopeful, and we have to all work together. Um, thank you very much for listening, and uh, looking forward to a coffee break, I think. <laughs> <laughs>